Ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth of a series of lectures on Britain and Europe since 1945. And this lecture will describe how Britain finally entered the European community as the European Union was then known in 1973 after two failed attempts. Now, one of the remarkable features of the 1970s is that the political alignments and attitudes of the parties towards Europe were almost exactly opposite to what they are today. Now, today, the most sympathetic of the two major parties towards Europe is the Labour Party. They're broadly pro-European. But the main party of the right, the Conservatives, are divided and predominantly Eurosceptic. <clears throat> in the 1970s, by contrast, it was the opposite. The Conservatives, under the leadership of Edward Heath, the most pro-European Prime Minister we've ever had, were the Euro enthusiasts. Now, just 40 years ago, in March 1974, Heath resigned as Prime Minister having narrowly lost a general election in which Europe was a major issue. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was replaced by Labour's Harold Wilson as Prime Minister of a minority government. And one year after that, in 1975, Heath lost the Conservative leadership to Margaret Thatcher. But she too began as a Euro enthusiast, continuing to support the European Union. She became a Eurosceptic much later than is usually imagined. Now, conservative pro-Europeanism extended then even to conservative-supporting newspapers. In 1975, at the time of the referendum on the common market, the Daily Mail said that food supplies would be endangered if we did not stay in Europe. And it said in the case of a no vote to Europe, it insisted there would be, and I quote, no coffee, wine, beans or bananas till further notice. <clears throat> now, in the 1970s, it was the Labour Party and not the Conservatives who were bitterly divided over Europe. And indeed, Europe threatened to break up the Labour Party. And it was for this reason that Labour came to support a referendum on Europe as a device to hold the party together. And indeed, Labour was to split partly on Europe in 1981 when a pro-European faction led by Roy Jenkins, who'd formerly been deputy leader, and David Owen, a former foreign secretary, formed a new party, the Social Democrat Party, which formed an alliance with the Liberals and eventually merged with the Liberals to form the current Liberal Democrats. The Liberals and, and Liberal Democrats are the only really consistent party uh, they um, were enthusiastic supporters of Europe then and are so now. But the other parties all changed their viewpoints. Also, the nationalist parties in Scotland and Wales, at that time they favoured a no vote in the referendum in 1975. And whereas today it's said that Scotland is worried in case the rest of the United Kingdom leaves Europe when they want to stay in, in the 1970s the worry was the opposite, that Scotland might vote no, while the rest of the country voted yes. So the alignments, it's very strange, they were almost opposite to what they are today, 40 years ago. And one has to remember that, I think, to make sense of the debates of the 1970s. <clears throat> now, I ended my last lecture in 1967, after the second failed application to join the European community or the common market. And this was vetoed again by de Gaulle, and it was a second humiliation for Britain. But the Labour government under Wilson refused to accept defeat and said it would leave the application on the table. And in 1969, de Gaulle resigned as President of France after being defeated in a domestic referendum and was succeeded by Georges Pompidou, who, although a Gaullist, was uh, more sympathetic to Britain and more pragmatic. And he did not share the semi-mystical view that de Gaulle held of France's national destiny. So it appeared that prospects might improve for British entry. But Pompidou insisted that before enlargement of Europe could be considered, agreement had to be reached 
on the financing of the common agricultural policy. He said that was a precondition for the end of the French veto. And he told the French public after the event on television, he said, I achieved on the one hand a definitive agricultural settlement in return for on the other the opening of negotiations with Britain. Now the effect of the common agricultural policy was that Britain would be the second largest net contributor to the European community budget after Germany. And France, with her large agricultural sector, would be a leading beneficiary. But at that time, Britain's gross national product was well below that of France or Germany. Was this fair or reasonable that Britain should be contributing so much? It was a heavy cost to Britain. And this was to become a running sore in the negotiations between Britain and the original six members of the European community. It was to remain a serious problem for Britain after she joined until it was finally settled after much negotiation by Margaret Thatcher in 1984. But uh, the six, in addition to settling the common agricultural policy, adopted a new policy just before Britain entered the European community, and that was the common fisheries policy. And that was adopted on the day that negotiations opened with Britain. Now, this again was damaging to British interests because she had huge reserves of fish, which would not otherwise be open to the fishing fleets of the other six. And indeed, Britain was proposing to join with three other candidate members, Denmark, Ireland, and Norway. And if you take those four together, their fishing catch was more than double that of the original six that were imposing the common fisheries policy. And they adopted the policy on the day that negotiations opened with Britain. Now, the common fisheries policy was a main reason why Norway did not join the European Union. She rejected it in a referendum. And she didn't want her fishing fields to be open to those of the other member states. But Britain could reasonably regard it, I think not unfairly, as a hostile act on the part of the six to open a common fisheries policy and begin negotiating it and completing it before Britain actually joins so that her or our interests suffered from it. There was another policy being developed at the time, which is very controversial now, but oddly enough, British leaders didn't find it so controversial then, and that was European monetary union and the idea of a common currency. Now, many people think the eurozone uh, and the uh, euro and all that is a fairly recent development in Europe, but it was first planned long ago, almost 45 years ago. It was proposed in a report for the European community by Pierre Werner, who was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg and had been asked to produce a plan by the six. <clears throat> and he produced his plan in 1970. And what the Werner report proposed was a total and irreversible convertibility of currencies with permanent fixing of rates. And the report concluded, considerations of a psychological and political order militate in favour of the adoption of a single currency which would guarantee the irreversibility of the undertaking. So the origins of the Eurozone lie in 1970. <clears throat> now, British leaders did not object to this. Indeed, they supported it. And in October 1972... Edward Heath said to the House of Commons that he told President Pompidou, and I quote, that Britain looked forward wholeheartedly to joining in the economic and monetary development of the community. And this, of course, raised the problem of the transfer resources, uh, as has happened with the Eurozone, from poorer countries, of which Britain was then one, to the richer countries, for example, Germany. And there was perhaps a real danger that given Britain's economic position in the 70s, she might find herself in the position that Greece or Spain now find themselves in the Eurozone. 
But whether that is so or not, neither the Labour government of Wilson in the late 1960s nor the government of Heath after 1970 made any objection to the common currency or to monetary union. They were both then prepared to support a policy which now both parties reject, a common currency. And all this is clear evidence, and there was public knowledge for it, that the European Union was more than a mere trading arrangement, and anyone who wanted to establish the facts could easily do so. Uh, and that it had at its aim ever closer union, political union. In October 1972, the heads of government of the European Community States, which then included Britain, who had successfully negotiated entry by then and was about to join, they said their aim was to create a European Union by 1980. Uh, they did not define European Union. But in 1973, the heads of government met, and that included Britain, who was now in the European Union, and they issued the following declaration. They said, the member states, the driving force of European construction, affirm their intention to transform, before the end of the present decade, the whole complex of their relations into a European Union. And they added, the heads of state or of government reaffirm the determination of the member states to achieve economic and monetary union. That was all on the record. Now, uh, it wasn't clear what European Union meant. And someone said to President Pompidou, this was an unclear phrase, and President Pompidou replied, that is, that is the beauty of it. But the Danish Prime Minister, Mr Jorgensen, did query what this meant. And the record of the discussion say he asked, was it a federation, a confederation, or something else which they were trying to set up? But the British record of the discussion continues. Happily, he did not ask for a reply and President Pompidou lost no time in winding up the proceedings. Now, uh, people say and have said that they were deceived about Europe, that they thought they were joining a free trade area. But it was absolutely clear on the record of what the aim was, some form of European Union, however defined, ever closer union, and clear that plans for monetary union were already there, that it wasn't simply a free trade area. Now, of course, um, it's much easier to say that you're prepared to do this in advance than when it comes to the time. And uh, some people say they were deceived by the white paper issued by the Heath government in 1971, which said there would be no erosion of essential national sovereignty. Now, the reason they could say that, and it wasn't wholly misleading at the time, was that the great powers had, each great power had a veto on developments in the European Union. Uh, it was agreed that um, no important measure would be instituted if any one member state thought it affected their most serious national interests. So British leaders could reasonably say that any further developments depended on the consent of each country. But there was a further key factor which I think wasn't mentioned, and that wasn't out of malice, but I think no people didn't really fully understand it. I think even public lawyers didn't fully understand it. And those who attended my last lecture may remember I discussed these two key cases of the European Court of Justice, which determined that the laws of the European community, as it then was, were superior to the laws of the member states, and would have direct effect on the member states, whatever their parliaments did. So that the European system of law was a superior system of law to that of Britain, France, Germany, and so on. So the European Union was a very different sort of organization from any other that we joined, like NATO, for example, or the United Nations. It was a superior legal order. And that meant that Westminster was no longer sovereign now, we can see that as it works, I think, very 
remarkably, in um, policy on immigration. Now, there are a large number of people who would like to see immigration from the European Union countries restricted. And we have in Britain already restricted immigration from non-EU countries, including Commonwealth countries. But we cannot restrict immigration from the EU countries because of the principle in the Treaty of Rome of the free movement of labour. And that's a clear example. You may think it's good, you may think it's bad. Obviously, opinions would differ. But it's a clear example of a restriction of sovereignty, of something that Parliament might want to do, but can't do. It would be illegal to do it under European law. That wasn't stressed at the time, I think, because people genuinely didn't notice this effect. Even public lawyers, academics who should have noticed it, most of them didn't either. So um, I think it was probably unfair to say that the aims of the European community were hidden. The aims were mostly publicly stated, and it was clear to anyone who took the trouble to look that it was more than a free trade area. But where was it going? What was its final aim? That perhaps wasn't so clear. And in 1973, an economist called Andrew Schonfield delivered a series of wreath lectures called Journey to an Unknown Destination. And that perhaps is the fairest description of the journey on which Britain was embarking in the 1970s. Now, perhaps remarkably, you may think, in the general election of 1970, all three of the major parties favoured entry. And that was a great change from the election of 1959, which I discussed a while ago, when none of the parties, not even the pro-European liberals, mentioned Europe so much as mentioned it in their manifestos. All the parties uh, said that Britain ought to join. And the Labour Party manifesto was particularly positive. But the Labour Party was defeated in the election by the Conservatives, led by Edward Heath, who I think was the most pro-European prime minister that we've ever had, arguably the only pro-European prime minister we've ever had. Um, his maiden speech in Parliament in the House of Commons in 1950 had been a criticism of Attlee and Bevin for not joining the Schumann plan, the coal and steel community, a precursor of the common market. And he'd been in charge of the negotiations in the first failed application from 1961 to 3, and he'd won golden opinions on the continent, even though these negotiations had failed. Now, his strong Europeanism derived, in my view, from his experiences of the 1930s, when he'd visited um, Nazi Germany and attended a Nuremberg rally at which he said Hitler had brushed past him and he'd shaken hands with Himmler. And uh, unlike most conservatives at the time, he was a strong supporter of Churchill against the appeasement policy of Neville Chamberlain. And again, unlike most conservatives, he supported the Republicans in Spain against General Franco, against the right-wing movement. And he'd also fought in the war when he'd uh, risen to a high rank, a lieutenant colonel. And for him, a united Europe was the best guarantee against future wars. And after successfully negotiating British entry, he made a television broadcast in which he said this, Many of you have fought in Europe, as I did, or have lost a father or brothers or husbands who fell fighting in Europe. I say to you now, with that experience in my memory, that joining the community, working together with them for our joint security and prosperity, is the best guarantee we can give ourselves of a lasting peace in Europe. So that was a kind of negative aim, avoid wars in Europe. But there was also a positive and strategic view of the future, the future of Britain in Europe, complemented um, um, by uh, a mastery of detail on the subjects uh, that he was negotiating in. Uh, he had a view of Europe as a power uh, on it in its own right. And he'd first shown that mastery of detail in the negotiations in 1961 on such matters as butter and cheese, very detailed matters. And this had caused him to be caricatured by private eye in a description which he never entirely shook off of Grocer Heath or the Grocer 
and originally in private, he was accompanied by a senior civil servant called Sir Brussels Sprout. <laughs> and um, for some people, for pro-Europeans, Heath was and is a visionary. For his op the opponents of Europe, he's someone who sacrificed British nationhood and sold the country's interest out. For extreme, extreme anti-Europeans used to call him traitor Heath. <coughs> But at the time, uh, this was important if you believed that Britain should enter. And the effect on the French and on Pompidou, President Pompidou, was, was um, undoubted. Because Heath's sincerity was unimpeachable. He was a man with whom the French could do business. You couldn't doubt that Heath was European. And President Pompidou said in 1973, after Britain had joined Europe, he said that until now, he said, virtually the sole link between the continent and Britain had been called Heath. So with Heath there, prospects seemed quite good for a British entry. But Heath's problem was that public support for entry had plummeted since the 1960s. That the popular enthusiasm and momentum, which was there in the early 1960s, had gone down. And by the time his government came to power in 1970, support for entry was about 20% opinion had moved against Europe. So although all three parties were in favour, the public were sceptical. And there was a danger of another veto, not this time by the French, but by the British public. And this was something Heath had to bear in mind. But the main reason for public opposition was not, as it had been earlier, worries about the Commonwealth, which was receding in importance. And it wasn't the worry that came later the loss of sovereignty, it was a likely rise in the cost of living and in particular food prices from joining the European community. And the opposition was led by Enoch Powell, at that time still a Conservative MP, and he was for a time after his speeches on immigration the most popular politician in the country, and many thought that Heath's victory in 1970 had been really a victory for Powell, who'd spoken in favour of the Conservatives, and rather than a victory for Heath, who never established that degree of popularity. And the Labour left were also then opposed to Europe, which they said would interfere with socialist planning. And that was a problem for Harold Wilson, who was now the leader of the opposition, because the left had made Wilson leader, and they formed, as it were, his Praetorian Guard, the main basis of his support against those trying to overthrow him. Now, the Conservative manifesto in 1970, perhaps oddly, was a bit more cautious about Europe than Labour's. But it used words that would later come back to haunt the Heath government. The manifesto said, Obviously, there is a price we should not be prepared to pay. Our sole commitment is to negotiate no more no less. And just before the election, in May 1970, Heath used in Paris words which again were to come back to haunt him later on. He said that Europe could not be enlarged without, I quote, the full-hearted consent of the peoples and parliaments of the applicant countries. Now Heath said that what he meant uh, as anyone who knew the British Constitution should know, that the consent of the people in Britain, as opposed to perhaps the other applicant countries, was given not separately in a referendum, for which there was no constitutional basis at that time, but through Parliament. So approval of the peoples and parliaments meant in Britain approval of the people through Parliament. But he had in fact spoken of peoples and parliaments, not the people through Parliament, so he was open to criticism when he took Britain into Europe without seeking popular approval. Especially because in the general election of 1970, as I've said, all three parties were in favour of Europe. So if you were a voter who didn't think we should enter the European community, how were you to show that by your vote? There was no way in which the government could say, I think, it had a mandate, popular mandate, if that is what's needed to enter Europe. He couldn't claim a genuine popular mandate. So that was also a problem uh, throughout the negotiations and afterwards. Now, um, 
In the first negotiations in 1961, Harold Macmillan had hoped there would be a genuine negotiation between Britain and the Six. But the Six said, not unreasonably, I think, that the European community was already a going concern. The rules were already made, and it was for Britain to decide whether or not to accept them. And that was even more so by 1970. There was now what the European community called, and the Europeans still calls, an acquis communautaire. And the acquis communautaire is a series of treaties, laws, and decisions that had already been agreed by the six and on the statute book of the European community. And that included, as we've seen, the common agricultural policy. An applicant country had to accept these policies fully. There was no question of untying the package of challenging them. Uh, the, the same is true, uh, for example, now. It's one of the problems David Cameron will face in renegotiation. When the ex-communist states joined in 2004, there was an acquis communautaire which they had to accept. Uh, what some say David Cameron's asking for is for that now to be untied. It's a very difficult thing to do. But at that time, at any rate, there was no question of special provisions for Britain. And in particular, if you wanted an alleviation of the conditions of the common agricultural policy, what this meant was, in practice, that Britain should pay less into the agricultural fund. Now, if Britain paid less, another country or countries would have to pay more. And you can understand they weren't particularly sympathetic to that. Now, the previous Labour government had accepted that they would have to um, accept the acquis communautaire. And in July 1967, the Labour Party's Foreign Secretary, George Brown, said, we accept all three treaties, that is a treaty setting up the European communities, subject only to the adjustments which are required to provide for the accession of a new member. Her Majesty's Government accept without reserve all the aims and objectives of the three treaties and will implement them. So the negotiations were, in a sense, peripheral. The French, under President Pompidou, had already decided that she would no longer resist British entry, provided the common agricultural policy was in place, which it was by 1970. And Britain had to make a decision in principle as to whether to join a fully functioning organisation, or club, if you like, or not. Whether it were you swallow the medicine whole or not at all, you can't have a partial uh, a medicine. You have to take the lot. Now, both Wilson and Heath, it seemed at that time, had decided they would. But, of course, the arrangements of the six founder members were not necessarily those suitable for Britain. The common agricultural policy in particular meant a system of community preference. And what that meant was protection against foodstuffs coming from outside Europe. In Britain's case, that meant protection, tariff protection, against cheap food coming from the Commonwealth. Uh, hitherto, the Commonwealth countries had given us cheap food. But instead, we would have to buy more expensive food from the continent. Now, in future, we would also have to fit in with a continental method of subsidising agriculture, which wouldn't be the way we'd done it hitherto uh, by the taxpayer. It had previously been subsidised through, through subsidies for the taxpayer. But by the continental method, subsidised by the consumer, who would sustain the farmer by paying higher prices, guaranteed prices for agricultural products. And this, of course, meant an increase in our cost of living. Moreover, hitherto, protection for agricultural goods in Britain had just been for British farmers. We didn't, of course, protect Commonwealth farmers. But under the European system, we'd be protecting all farmers, British farmers, French, German, Luxembourg, Belgium, and so on. And um, the agricultural sectors of all the European member states would be subsidised through higher prices. Now, as if this were not enough, the monies collected from the common agricultural policy would not be given back to the country in which it was raised, but they'd be put into a central fund in Brussels, 
become part of what was called the European Community's own resources and redistributed to member states in proportion to the size of their agricultural sectors. Now, the British agricultural sector was 3%, the German 8 to 9%, the French 12 to 13%, the Italian 22 to 23%. So this meant that we would pay more for our food, contribute more to the fund than any other member state except Germany, and of course France and Italy with their large agricultural sectors would benefit considerably. The French and Italians would be able to sell their food at higher prices in the British market to replace cheap Commonwealth food, and they would of course benefit from the redistribution of the fund because of their large agricultural sectors. They would also benefit from the common fisheries policy because our fisheries uh, fields and the Danes and the Irish were, were much greater than those of the six. Now, uh, when Heath met President Pompidou, he defended these arrangements on grounds of high principle. He said entry into the Europe would require a profound change in British thinking. He said she must become what the French called communautaire. And he said community preference was the heart of Europe. The six, he said, had abolished customs barriers between themselves and the impo they imposed a penalty on trade with outside members in the form of a common external tariff. They wanted to encourage member states to trade with each other rather than with the outside world. Therefore, President Pompidou said, the common agricultural policy was an essential part of the European community. He said many in Britain, he admitted, wanted a free trade area, but he said the European community couldn't be that. Now this, no doubt, was a fine statement of general principles, but behind it, of course, there was the French national interest, which wasn't necessarily the same as the British national interest. And indeed, Pompidou said to Edward Heath that it was very important to preserve the French countryside and the way of life. He said the small farmer was a very important figure in France, the member of a politically sensible and moderate class resisting socialism, Pompidou being a figure of the right-wing Gaullist party. He said if, you had, if all these people moved to the towns, the socialists and communists would gain votes. So he said this, the common agricultural policy was part of a European philosophy stressing the importance of the small farmer and that Europe should not become a wholly urban civilization that farmers um, preserve the equilibrium of French society. Now, I think it's reasonable to say, and Britain was often accused of using arguments based on self-interest uh, in the community, I think it's reasonable to say the French were not doing something wholly different. And uh, Bismarck, the German chancellor in the 19th century, had said, the word Europe was usually heard from those politicians who demanded from other powers what they in their own name dare not request. That's not, I think, wholly unfair. Now, the common agricultural policy was buttressed by the veto. As I said earlier, um, no major policy could be changed, no major development could occur except by unanimity. And that had been insisted upon by de Gaulle it was called the Luxembourg Compromise. It wasn't really a compromise, though it did occur in Luxembourg. Uh, and de Gaulle insisted that on matters of vital national interest, each country should have a veto. And Britain, of course, favoured this because we were worried about majority voting and the loss of sovereignty. But again, all this was in French interest. Once you had secured the common policies which benefited France, such as the common agriculture policy and the common fisheries policy, it was sensible to freeze the community. So you couldn't alter or amend the policies without unanimity. And you couldn't introduce any new common policies which might perhaps benefit Britain without unanimity. Edward Heath very much hoped that these policies could be complemented by a regional policy, um, a European regional policy, which would help the depressed industries and regions in Britain. And there might be other policies, which common policies, which might be developed, which, unlike the agriculture policy, would help Britain. But that couldn't come about without unanimity. The veto remained until 1986, the Single European Act. 
which was an amendment to the Treaty of Rome, and it was removed, remarkably, you will think, at the insistence of the British government led by Margaret Thatcher. It was she who was responsible for the removal of the veto, and for this reason that Britain said she had a great interest in completing the internal market, that is, the removal of non-tariff barriers to trade. And Britain argued, I think rightly, this would help particularly the City of London. But you couldn't do that if the removal of every single barrier would be subject to a veto. There were over 300 of them, I think. If every one was subject to a veto, you'd make no progress. So Britain insisted there should be majority voting. That ended the veto. Now, uh, so far, I may have given a negative case about British entry, but the pro-marketers had a reply. They said this. The cost of Britain for these policies was, and still is, a comparatively small proportion of the British budget, around 1% of gross national product. It's now a bit over that. And this is counterbalanced, they said, by the fact that Britain would secure entry into the internal market. And it's one of the problems that people who wanted to leave the European Union have, that uh, to, to achieve entry into the internal market, you have to accept the rules of the European Union. And so you, you might be outside the European Union, but subject to the rules and having no role in helping to make them. And the British also said that there would be what they called dynamic effects from British entry. And these dynamic effects would be that entry into European industrial markets would assist British industry. Now, the trouble was that these dynamic effects were highly uncertain, whereas the costs were absolutely assured. The rise in the cost of living and the high budgetary contribution were there, and you couldn't alter those. The dynamic effects were possible, but who knows? And, of course, uh, if Britain had free entry into continental markets... Continental countries also had free entry into British markets, and in particular Germany, with her powerful industrial base, might benefit more than Britain. Now, supporters of entry also argued that Britain could have secured her own national interest better had she involved herself in Europe earlier, at the time of the Schumann Plan in 1950, or when the Treaty of Rome was being drawn up. And the aim, in their view was to restore a position which had been lost by the mistakes of the 1950s. But opponents would reply that our own interests were so different from that of the other six that the European community would always have been inimical to our interests. So it was a very balanced argument, and of course it continues today. But it was accepted in the early 1970s, even by supporters of British entry, that the economic benefits would be marginal at best. And the main argument for joining on the part of Macmillan and Wilson as well as Heath was not the economic advantage, but the political advantage that entry would bring. And they all said, unless Britain joined, she'd be politically isolated, that there were no real alternatives. The special relationship with America, they said, if it existed at all, could not be a relationship of equals when Britain was a quarter the size of America. There was no alternative. And one diplomat said later on that by joining, there was a chance of saving a little of the position we've lost. And if we don't take this opportunity, we shall be of no more account than a small peripheral European country. We would be relegated to the second division. That is what I think is so wrong now. Everybody complains they're not getting something out. We never went in to get something out. We went in to prevent our being kicked down to a really lower league. Our power of attraction to the European countries was diminishing all the time. And one peer said in the House of Lords in July 1971, you do not haggle over the subscription when you are invited to climb into a lifeboat. You scramble abroad while there is still a seat for you. But Heath uh, had a more positive view. For him, joining Europe was the beginning of a journey which would lead not to a federal Europe, because he, like the French, had little interest in that, but closer political collaboration between the member states, including defence, 
so that Europe could be a real power in the world and decisions in Europe would no longer be dominated by the Americans. It was an attempt to end the hegemony of the superpowers in his view. And he said Europe could not hope to exert any influence unless united. It had to have a powerful economic base given to it by the European community. And then Europe could develop a political personality of her own, which would no longer be that of a vassal state of America. He wanted a strong Europe to speak with a single voice. He had a historical view of Britain's place in Europe. Oddly enough, it wasn't very different from that of de Gaulle or of de Gaulle's disciple, President Pompidou. A Europe des patries, a Europe des états, a Europe of nation states. And his view was very similar, I think, to the French view. So it was clear that Britain, British leaders, whether Labour or Conservative, in 1970 saw no alternative and the negotiations were basically on comparatively peripheral matters. They were not fundamental. And they concentrated on various transitional arrangements. Now, the negotiations were in effect sealed in May 1971 when Heath paid a state visit to Paris and he met uh, President Pompidou and uh, they had dinner. And at the dinner, Pompidou said, through two men who are talking to each other, two peoples are trying to find each other again. To find each other to take part in a great joint endeavour. The construction of a European group of nations determined to reconcile the safeguarding of their national identities with the constraints of acting as a community. Again, very fine words but they meant that the Entente Cordiale was being revived. And after the meeting, Pompidou gave a press conference and he said this. Many people believed that Great Britain was not and did not wish to become European and that Britain wanted to enter the community only so as to destroy it or divert it from its objectives. Many people also thought that France was ready to use every pretext to place, in the end, a fresh veto on Britain's entry. And then he turned to Edward Heath and said, well, ladies and gentlemen, you see before you tonight two men who are convinced of the contrary. And he said he had put four questions to Edward Heath. He said, first, did he accept the very basis of the European Community for Agriculture? the principle of community preference, whereby we feed ourselves in the first place from within the community. And Heath had replied, yes. He then said, do you accept the veto, the rule of unanimity? And Britain again said, yes. Then he said, do you accept that sterling should end its role as a reserve currency and Britain should play her part in the development of monetary union? And Heath again said, yes. But the most important question, he said, was the fourth one. Would Britain become really European? Would Britain answer the question first posed by de Gaulle? And Pompidou put it in this way. Whether Britain, which is an island, had decided to moor herself to the continent, and if she was therefore ready to come in from the wide seas which had always drawn her. And he said Edward Heath had convinced him that his conception of Europe was similar to that of the French. So that seemed settled. But Heath now had um, really a much larger problem, which was to win over parliamentary opinion. And at first sight, that did not seem a problem because he had a majority of 30 in Parliament. The trouble was that there were over 15 Conservative MPs including, of course, Enoch Powell, who would vote against Europe uh, under any circumstances, that there were more anti-Europeans than made up his majority. Now, he could rely on the support... There were six, only six Liberal MPs then. And he could rely on the support of five of those. But even that wouldn't be enough. He would need the support of the Labour Party. Now, at first sight that didn't seem to be a problem because, after all, as I've said, the Labour Party had made the application in the late 60s 
Its manifesto in 1970 had been even more enthusiastic than the Conservatives. It had left the application on the table. But in opposition, the activists in the Labour Party, the constituency members, were moving against Europe. The left wing was moving against Europe. And they said, you can use the European issue to vote against Heath and remove him from power. And they said, if Harold Wilson doesn't join with that, we will get rid of him and replace him by someone who will remove Heath on the European issue. And less than a year after the June 1970 election, the challenge appeared. Now, it didn't come from the left. It was more dangerous than that. It came from a leading figure of the right, James Callaghan, who'd been Home Secretary and Chancellor in the Labour government, and a man very popular with the grassroots of the Labour Party. Indeed, he said he didn't need opinion polls to tell him what Labour Party people were thinking. In May 1971, Callaghan was due to make a speech in Manchester, and he briefed the press beforehand that they ought to come down if they wanted to hear the next leader of the Labour Party. And that, of course, got to Wilson's ears and I think rather frightened him. Callaghan attacked the Conservative approach to Europe. He said it would mean a complete rupture of our identity and said that monetary union would lead to unemployment. But the part that caused the most comment was his response to President Pompidou, who had referred to French as the language of Europe and had dismissed English as the language of the United States. And Callaghan said this, he said, millions of people have been surprised to hear that the language of Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton must in future be regarded as an American import from which we must protect ourselves if we are to build a new Europe. We can agree, he said, that the French own the supreme prose literature in Europe, but if we are to prove our Europeanism, by accepting that French is the dominant language in the community, then my answer is quite clear, and I will say it in French to prevent any misunderstanding. <laughs> non merci beaucoup. <laughs> now, what he was saying non merci beaucoup to was the idea of the French language superseding the English. But as he well knew, it was being interpreted to mean a norm to Europe, full stop. And this was a clear threat to Harold Wilson and a more immediate threat to Labour's deputy leader, who was Roy Jenkins, who was a passionate pro-European. Now, Wilson says in his memoirs, in all my 13 years as leader of the party, I had no more difficult task than keeping the party together on the issue and he said of the pro-Europeans, he meant, I think, primarily Jenkins, that their adherence to the European community was not so much a policy as a way of life. And Barbara Castle, who was on the left and anti-Europe, called Jenkins and his pro-Europeans, he said they were sanctimonious middle-class hypocrites because they were sacrificing a wonderful opportunity to defeat Edward Heath. And in July the Labour Party conference voted against entering Europe in July 1971. A special conference was called. And this was an embarrassment for Jenkins. Could he remain deputy leader, strongly favouring Britain entering Europe, when the party conference had repudiated it? And it put Labour in an embarrassing position. And in the following interview, which I hope the IT people will show, you can see how Callaghan dealt with that embarrassment. Callaghan and Jenkins, I should say, were not the best of friends. You can see how it happened. If the IT people can uh, put the interview with, with Robin Day, who some people may remember. We'll have to start. Turning for a final moment or two, if we may, Mr Callaghan, to the problem of the Parliamentary Labour Party now, following this uh, overwhelming conference decision. I don't know what oh, problem there is in the Parliamentary Labour Party because I'm not entitled to speak for them. I'm speaking here tonight on behalf of the NEC for whom I made the speech this afternoon. But as a very wise and experienced and senior member of the Parliamentary oh, Labour come, Party... come, you don't catch an old bird like that. 
Mr. Callaghan, do you think that uh, Mr. Jenkins should remain as deputy leader in these circumstances, knowing his views? Mr. Bur Mr. Day, you've been an interviewer for a long time, and you knew before you even phrased the question that you wouldn't get me to comment on that particular matter in the light of what I've said to you. Uh, now, ha have another try if you like, but you won't get any further with it. Why not turn to a more profitable line? Because it's a matter of great interest well, to a lot of people here. Well, in that case, you'd better discuss it with Mr. Jenkins, but you're not going to get me to make statements that you'll then throw at Mr. Jenkins and try to set us at each other's ears. I'm not going to take part in that game to satisfy a television panel. Now, then let's turn to something else. No, do, you, do you think that a deputy leader who is in... No, I'm not answering any questions about what a deputy leader should or should not do. Now, please go on to something else. Do you think it's not a matter of public interest? Of course it is, and it's a matter for Mr. Jenkins, if he wishes to discuss, to discuss with you. But I am not Mr. Jenkins. But do you not have any views on the subject yourself? Robin, why don't you turn to something where you'll get a little more All help? Right. Are you a candidate for the deputy leadership? No, you know I'm not. I don't know. I'm very, don't you? I'm very grateful to have a... Do you think that... Uh, do you no, th no, Robin, leave it. Uh, I no, no, leave it. I haven't started yet. Well, well in, if you haven't started, no, no. then I beg of you not to start and turn to something no, I, else. I was you? about to. Uh, you are, really? You I promise? I was about to, yes. Okay, all right. If the uh, market minority in the Parliament... Uh, decide to vote. Do you know, I believe there's going to be the same question mm. phrased in a different way. Well, give me a chance. Decide to vote. Do you really think it is fair to say, because a lot of them don't, uh, do you really think it is fair to say that they are voting to sustain Mr Heath, voting oh. for the Tories? Well, I thought it was the same question phrased in a different way. Well, when the Parliamentary Labour Party meets, it will take its own decision. At that time, you can ask the leaders of the Parliamentary Labour Party what they have to say about that particular matter. Thank you, Mr. Callaghan. Well, thank you. Modified, thanks. <laughs> now, the pressure on the um, leadership of the Labour Party came to be such that it appeared the Labour Party would commit itself not only to voting against Edward Heath, but committing the party to withdraw from Europe if it won power. And Wilson, at this point, said he would resign as leader if Labour made that commitment. And eventually, a formula was discovered by which the Labour Party could unite. And the formula was this, that they would vote against entry in Parliament on what they called Tory terms. They would then support a renegotiation if the Labour Party won the election. And they would put that to the British people in a general election or referendum. And that's a mirror image of what David Cameron said last year in his Bloomberg speech on Europe. He said he would renegotiate the terms of European entry and he would then put it to the British people in a referendum. The referendum was originally Tony Benn's idea, but he had no support, though Callaghan said rather presently, Tony may be launching a little rubber life raft, which we will all be glad of in a year's time and eventually the Labour Party did commit itself to a referendum and Wilson supported it to prevent Labour committing itself to withdrawal. But there was clearly a real danger with this position that Heath would be defeated because the Labour Party was committed on a three-line whip to vote against so-called Tory terms. However, 69 Labour MPs led by Roy Jenkins broke the whip, as it were, and voted with the Conservatives and a further 20 abstain. And it's through them, with, whether you think it's a good thing or not, it's through the Labour rebe rebellion, the Labour rebels, that we entered Europe. And that, in a way, is the genesis of the, what was going to be the split in the Labour Party in the early 1980s that led to the SDP. Heath had a majority of 112 in the vote. So you can see, without the 69, he would not have won a majority. He would have been defeated. Uh, he was so pleased that he celebrated in a way that only Heath could do. He returned to number 10 Downing Street and played on his clavichord the first prelude from Bach's 48 Preludes and Fugues. He was a keen amateur pianist and this was his way of celebrating. However, he faced a problem later on because this was the vote of principle, but the rebels uh, were not able to vote with him on the implementing legislation. So that was often on a knife edge and the second reading was carried by just eight votes, and the third reading by just 17 votes. It was a huge 
battle to get it through, and Heath made it a matter of confidence. He said a defeat would mean an immediate dissolution of Parliament and a general election. In January 1972, Heath signed the Treaty of Accession in Brussels. He invited Harold Wilson to attend, but Wilson declined. And we joined on the 1st of January 1973. We'd been a member for just over 40 years, though um, a few years ago I heard speaking at Chatham House a Labour MP from a safe seat in the north of England who said he'd been canvassing and a constituent came up to him and said, I'm, I'm for you, I shall vote for you. He said, but the one thing I really don't like is Europe and I don't think we should join. And he's this Labour MP said, but we have been a member of the European Union for f nearly 40 years now. And the reply was, isn't that just typical of the politicians? They never tell you anything. <laughs> now, uh, Heath uh, was going to mark the year, and I did mark the year 1973. He calls a chapter in his memoirs on that year, Fanfare for Europe. And he established um, a, a musical a festival, as it were, to begin, uh, led by the great conductor Sir Georg Scholte. And uh, he says in his memoirs, I saw this as a wonderful new beginning and a tremendous opportunity for the British people. But fairly rapidly, disaster struck. First, there was a rise in food prices and the cost of living, which was very damaging to the Heath government which was trying to carry out an anti-inflationary policy and agree an incomes policy with the unions. That was very difficult, when from outside you had this external rise in food prices. Then the idea of monetary union, which meant fixed exchange rates, collapsed, when owing to British economic weakness, the Heath government had floated the pound in June 1972, it said it wasn't strong enough to join the fixed currency, which would increase unemployment. I mean, that, you may say, is a lesson of Greece and Spain. So the pound floated downwards. It's what Gordon Brown did, indeed, after 2007. And this uh, incurred the anger of President Pompidou, who said that fixed exchange rates were vital for the proper functioning of the common market and that floating was incompatible with that. And he said the motto of the city of Paris was fluctuat nec mergitur. And when asked to translate that, he said, he who floats doesn't join. <laughs> now, Pompidou had very cleverly linked British accession to monetary union with the establishment of a European regional fund, which meant money for Britain, depressed industries and regions and so on. And so Britain not joining the monetary fixed monetary snake, as it was called, meant that she didn't get any money for the regional fund, so that collapsed too. But the worst thing that happened was in autumn 1973, a war broke out in the Middle East, the so-called Yom Kippur War, when Egypt and Syria attacked Israel, seeking the return of Arab territory, which Israel had captured in the Six-Day War in 1967. And the Arab oil states, the so-called OPEC states, said that they would reduce oil production by 5% each month until Israel withdrew from occupied territory and the rights of the Palestinians were recognised. And that led to a fourfold increase in oil prices which wreaked havoc in the British economy uh, and, and the anti-inflation policy. But they said that they would privilege Britain and France compared with other European countries, because Britain and France had supported, so they said, the Arab states in the war. But the Dutch and the Germans had not. They'd taken the Israeli side. And the Arabs said they would impose an embargo on 58% of oil exports to the Netherlands. Now, you might think if European solidarity meant anything, this would mean that the British and French would share their oil supplies with the countries that were being damaged by the boycott. But perhaps you won't be surprised to hear that that wasn't what happened. And the head of the Foreign Office Energy Department in Britain said, we must resist short-term collective or collaborative approaches which would either set at risk our supplies from the Arab world or prejudice our full employment at a later stage of the benefits of North Sea oil. And Pompidou also opposed any intervention with the Arab states on behalf of the Netherlands or Germany, since he said the Arabs would then impose an embargo on France as well. And Britain agreed with that. And the Foreign Office said, we believe 
If the Arab states saw that their embargo was being openly frustrated, this would provoke them to reduce further oil supplies to Europe, thereby increasing the community's economic difficulties. In these circumstances, we judge it essential to continue to resist public declarations of community solidarity, which would only add to our problems. Even worse, in January 1974, France herself floated the franc, which ended all possibility of monetary union in the foreseeable future, and all ideas of European Union by 1980 disappeared completely. National pressures were undermining European solidarity. There was no European solidarity. And more fundamentally, in relation to Britain, it ended the association of Europe with economic prosperity. Now, in the 1960s, for the six founding members, economic prosperity strengthened their loyalty to Europe. They associated Europe with the long boom with prosperity. But soon after Britain joined, as it were, luck for the pro-Europeans ran out. The long boom ended, and it was associated with economic difficulty. Possible British loyalty to Europe was undermined. It, the loyalty might have been there if we joined in the 1960s, as Harold Macmillan wanted. If he'd succeeded in getting in, in 1963, attitudes might have been quite different, because that was the high watermark of British enthusiasm for Europe. Since then, there's been a long diminuendo, which continues, obviously, even today. And by the beginning of 1974, just 39% thought that membership had been helpful to Britain, 44% against. Now, Edward Heath was to lose the February 1974 election to Labour. He never again held power. And in 1975, he was deposed from the leadership of the Conservative Party by Margaret Thatcher. He therefore played no further role in the direction of British or European affairs, and with his departure went Britain's leading supporter of the European community, an instinctive European, sympathetic to monetary union and to political union. Perhaps only Blair has been equally European, though even that may be doubtful. But even Heath could not prevent the resurgence and recurrence of nationalism in 1973 and the collapse of European solidarity. And with his lack of communication skills, he could not persuade the British people of the value of the European adventure. He was a bit, I think, like Gordon Brown, that he couldn't communicate very effectively with the British public. But whether you think that Edward Heath was a visionary or tragically misguided, I hope you will all agree that the problems we face in Europe are by no means new ones, but were all, I think all of them, prefigured in the 1970s. Perhaps in Europe, at least, there is nothing new under the sun. Heath was replaced by Harold Wilson, and Harold Wilson and Labour said they would renegotiate Britain's membership to get a more satisfactory outcome, and then put the result to the British people in a referendum. Now, have you heard that more recently? <laughs> and I shall describe that outcome in the next lecture on the referendum. But a recent book on Britain's relations with Europe ends by quoting the famous aphorism of L.P. Hartley in his book, The Go-Between, who said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. But did they really do things so differently in the 1970s? I wonder. Thank you.